amazing. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. There are a few people I don't know yet, so that's so cool. Hi, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I am executive director here at Aubrey's Belong Vermont. And welcome to Brain Club. We are very, very excited for, you know, this is, it's interesting. We, we, uh, we started covering neurodiversity and employment back in May. Uh, was when our community advisory board said, you know, you need to take on employment. So we listen when the community advisory board tells us to do things. So that's how we inform all of our programs. Anyway, so um, we we did a we, we did a brain club, and people were so engaged by this topic. I think because like there's so many not neuro inclusive employment experiences going on in the world um, that we just said we're going to keep doing. So we've been doing a monthly neurodiversity and employment themed brain club since May. Anyway, and um, uh, let me share screen. That's not the screen. Like what? What's happening? All right, technology. Ah, that is the screen. Okay. And since I have no idea how to work my computer, I think whenever I whenever I uh, I try to be in like like single tile mode, I always see people that are not myself as the screen. I'm like, well, that's probably confusing. So anyway, here we are. Um, so. Um, since there are some folks who are new to Brain Club, just by way of introduction, you can participate any number of ways, whatever works for you. You can have your video on or off. And even if your video is on, we do not expect anything of you. You do not need to look, you do not need to sit still. Please just uh, do, do whatever needs doing, move, fidget, eat, stim, all the things. Um, and you can communicate however you want to. You can unmute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat box. You can gesture, emoticon, whatever, whatever works for you. And um, you know, safety is the most important thing to us. And so, hi, Matt. I'm so look at you. You just chatted. That's that's amazing. Did you like it? Amazing, um, amazing. So. <laughs> So anyway, um, in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, um, one thing we do here um, to create safety is just that you are welcome to talk about anything you feel comfortable talking about. But um, uh, this, 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 I think is is uh, this comes up when we think about workplace experiences that are traumatic and distressing. So, so if there's anything that you particularly experienced as traumatic or distressing, we just ask you to give a content warning for the topic so that people can listen with informed consent. And uh, when the this way, you know, if there's something that would be distressing for someone else, they can potentially turn off the sound or leave the room for a minute. And then I will type in the chat when the content warning topic is over. Other access need related um, uh, housekeeping is if you'd like closed captioning, depending on what version of Zoom you have, um, usually you will see either a live transcript CC icon to click or the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. Okay. For review, um, past brain clubs. This summer we spoke about niche construction, especially our, our theme for the month of June, about designing a life that works for your brain. Um, of course, that the, the prerequisite for that is to actually know how your brain works and what comes easily, what comes what's harder, like could not sequence those words. Um, and uh, what what are your sensory processing experiences? What are the things that give you meaning and purpose? And then we took it to the next level um, when, we, when we thought about, since what we don't want is the square peg that gets like <sighs> into the round hole, because what happens, you break the peg. And a lot of times that happens because our access needs are not met. 
and we'll talk more about access needs in a minute. Um, because when we asked our community advisory board this spring, how will we know that our community has become more neuroinclusive? What so many people told us is that it, access needs, what do I need to meaningfully and fully participate in my environment, in my experience? Everyone has access needs. And that can be a wide range of things. It can be things in the physical environment, emotional access needs, things related to communication, social, technology, like all kinds of things. And I think when we think about neuroinclusive employment, there are so many different layers and nuances for that. And if we, with, if we bring the framework of what do I need to access my employment, that becomes, I think, um, a different conversation than sometimes what goes on about, you know, uh, workplace culture or, 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 or whatever. Because, you know, when we think about diversity, equity, inclusion, if you can't even access your workplace environment, how on earth are you going to feel like you belong? That's, of course, what inclusion means. Um, this month at Brain Club, we've been talking about how do we intentionally create neurodiversity affirming environments, um, not just access, but affirming. And how do we intentionally cue safety? And so uh, we, we, we made this word cloud uh, from an interview with one of our board members, uh, Hannah Bloom, an occupational therapist, around uh, themes of, of cueing safety at home. So a neurodiversity affirming culture at home. And these were a lot of the topics that came up in, in that brain club from, from two weeks ago. If you, if, you, if you missed that one, it's a good one. Go back and listen to the recording. Um, and these are like not things that uh, have, have appeared in any uh, you know, DEI at work training I've ever participated in. And they're important, they're really important. So as it relates to neuroinclusive employment specifically, one of, one, one of our projects here at, at All Brains Belong is our neuroinclusive employment bright spotting program. So this opened um, the spring and community members had the opportunity to nominate um, Vermont employers that are using principles of inclusive or universal design um, for, for All Brains to thrive. And uh, here, here again are our fall winners, and we've got a couple. We've 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 got one of these teams. Hello, Turtle Island team. It's nice to have you here as always. And when we um, studied these organizations, contact them, figure out what they what they do. Let that like got that their employees nominated them. Um, what what we're hearing. Um, is, is, is really matching what the literature shows about what goes into designing a neuroinclusive workspace. Things in the physical environment, thinking about communication, those are you know, both right, a direct overlap of access needs, but all of these relate to access needs. It's a culture of um, thinking about, acknowledging that, that we all have different brains that learn, think, and communicate differently. And so you, you, you have to create workflows that account for flexibility. And that, of course, can be hard to do. And it's really important to do that. Um, so um, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop share because um, I'm going to I'm going to throw a question out here um, for anyone who has actually worked in or been in um, a workplace situation where you felt like you belong, that your access needs can be, have been met? Like, has anyone actually had that experience that would, 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 would like to share? Hi, Sarah. It's always nice when your own staff says that. It's good. <laughs> Sarah, uh, if, if, can I put you on the spot? You want to talk yeah. about like what, what, like what do you think we intentionally do here that makes that so? Well, I think you know Sierra's talked about this at a brain club before, but um, 
when I filled out the application to work for All Brains Belong, the questions that were on even the application were so vastly different than any other position I'd ever had before. So questions like, what has worked for you in the past or not worked for you in the past? Because some of identifying, you know, what your access needs are is knowing what hasn't worked for you in the past and then course correcting and figuring out what works better for you in the present time. Um, so, you know, I think asking those questions up front and normalizing those questions and just, um, you know, getting clear on expectations ahead of time uh, really is very different than the way a lot of employers, uh, they just don't ask those questions, you know? So, um, yeah, I would say that that was definitely my first experience with it um, was just right up front. Thank you, Sarah. Mel? Um, hi, Matt. Yeah, I'm, I'm, am I interrupting? Not at all. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to mention briefly, I worked for... Um, a fundraising consulting firm um, and you know their main offices are in Manhattan and and I worked and lived all over the country and in all kinds of different um, communities and states and cities and so everything around me was always changing and everything needed to be created um, from scratch whenever I arrived in a new place um, which would have been impossible, except their planning, the plan that my job was to implement their plan. And their plan was so good and so tight and so well developed that I had to fly by the seat of my pants by the nature of the work. But the route to success, I just had to follow it. Um, and so, you know, that was. Yeah, that was a, it was one of the hardest work experiences of my life. Um, but, um, you know, I reflect back and I used to just think how difficult it was. Um, but I reflect back now and I'm like, man, you know, when they said your job is to make the plan work. Uh, it's because the plan worked unless it didn't. And then I had to do things differently, which was also good for my neurodivergent brain. So anyway. That is fascinating. I have many questions. Sierra has been so patient. Hi, Sierra. And then I have questions. Hi, everybody. Can you guys hear me? Totally. Awesome. I'm using a new headphone set today. Um, so I, I think just echoing off what Sarah said, something that was really important for me in starting at Alburns Belong was as a fairly new provider and coming into a new career, I had no idea what accommodations were even options and what I was allowed to ask for in a job, what I wasn't allowed to ask for. Um, and so having an employer who very specifically was like, here are options, what works for you or suggesting different, oh, I've seen this helpful for other people, kind of suggesting what accommodations have worked for other people in the practice. Um, or in whatever organization was really helpful as somebody coming in, not necessarily knowing what my access needs might be. Thank you for bringing that up, Sierra. I think that that is something that happens, like that, that comes up a lot here, like with our patients of like, I don't even know what to ask for. Like, and in fact, I would go so far as to say that um, when, when you put the onus on the person to come up with their own accommodations from scratch, that's like not fair and ableist. So it's, 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 it's just really, really hard um, when you have never thought about this before and you haven't had experience of things going well. Um, that's why, you know, when we, when we worded on our employment applications, what did not go well, uh, because you know, certainly we also ask like what, what is helpful. Um, but a lot of times it's the, the experiences of what did not go well that you can like zoom out and say, oh, those things kind of had something in common. I think maybe there's a theme here. And so then we have something to, you know, build a, build a life around. Just reading in the chat, um, uh, when I was struggling with panic attacks from sensory overwhelm, they asked if having my own office was helpful. Cool, that's great. 
it was helpful. Even though other social workers didn't have a private office, no one had an issue with it. I could go there and do paperwork when I needed to soothe my nervous system. And I was so grateful. I ended up really committed to the team because I knew they were committed to me. Amazing. And uh, Laura, Laura is asking, I'm especially curious about ADB. It seems like there'd be tons of conflicting access needs mm -hmm. when thinking about how to meet patient access needs while still meeting access needs of staff. Yes, yes, I will. I'm, I'm going to respond to, to how we navigate that. And um, uh, looks like part two question, thinking about my own question, Mel, I think we talked about this in the past, seems like being clearly able to name the essential duties of the job and articulate those to potential employees is critical. Absolutely. So um, I'll answer this in, in two parts. So one is about conflicting access needs when two people um, or more than, more than two people, multiple people need things that seem to be mutually exclusive. So like the example I always like to give is like in my house, uh, my sweet little love needs to make noise at the exact same time that I need complete quiet in order to think. Um, so conflicting access needs. And so, um, what we do at ABB for employment is exactly what we do at, in my house, which is that we just try to bring transparency and awareness to it. Like, um, let me give an, I'll, I'll give an example. So as it relates to um, my access needs as a, as a person um, and like a, a potential patient's access needs. So we're talking about conflicting access needs between like um, not just em employees or employer empl employer employee, but um, you know, uh, staff member and the people you're serving. So uh, I have auditory processing differences. When I don't have visual cues, it makes it really hard for me to know what you're saying. So guess what? The telephone, pretty hard. So um, also, I have the kind of brain that can't be in multiple places at the same time. I can only be in one, and I can only do one thing at a time. So like, I can't, in fact, be seeing patients and answering the telephone. So I say that. I say that I can't do that. Um, and I talk about my auditory processing differences. Even if I'm not seeing a patient, I have no idea what you're saying on the phone. So it's transparency. Like, hey, this is what our capacity is right now. This is what my personal capacity is. This is what my organizational capacity is. And you have multiple other ways of accessing this and you don't have to access this. Like, in fact, human beings have a finite capacity and no one I think tells people that like I don't think anyone ever told me that as a human there's actually a finite amount of time in the day and a finite amount of bandwidth spoons whatever you call it you don't get anymore when you run out of them and naming that is healthy I think Right, like Sarah's typing in the chat, transparency is the way out of chaos. Yes. And so we name that, we, we say literally that, um, we should probably like hang it on the wall for visual supports. Um, but it, 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 really, it really helps us. Transparency as a core value and acknowledging that in a culture of interdependence where it is not only okay, but it is normal and preferred to be connected um, uh, to and with other people, um, we, we really think about, um, you know, if something is hard, um, what, uh, you know, is, is, is that because there's a mismatch between someone's access needs um, and, and the environment? And is there another team member who that is actually their zone of genius? But now to Laura's second part of your question, and then I'm gonna catch up on the chat. Um, Laura asked, I was talking just about when you're, when you're hiring someone being really clear, hi Maggie, um, um, being really clear about um, what is, not just what are the required duties, but like what's the job, right? Because like I can think about so many times where I've like thought a job was going to be a certain way and then I get there and like it wasn't that at all. 
um, or the job description was so vague that I didn't even really know what it was going to be. And then I get there and I'm like, oh, this is terrible. Like, I, you know, I really want somebody working here who like wants to do this job, including um, like, like uh, 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 things that I can't do, right? Like I, I and, and that I wouldn't want to do. So it is just, it's more transparency, I think. I'm reading in the chat, Claudia says, I often need a handful of opportunities to quiet during the day. Uh, people sometimes make a comment that it makes me seem antisocial. Oh, yes, people do that. So uh, no, you have an access need to charge your brain, charge your battery. Um, uh, there's uh, somebody at Brain Club uh, uh, last month, I think, shared this, shared this story of like getting shamed for eating lunch in their own office. Um, like, eating lunch with other people in an indoor workroom is like a great way to get COVID, first off. Um, and a, only an individual can decide uh, where they are most comfortable eating lunch. So anyway, I'm so, so, so Claudia, the fact that you know that as an access need, it's an access need. And so um, sometimes that paradigm can sometimes insulate us from when someone else is shaming yeah i wonder if anyone else has um any anything that has worked in employment environments um zeph says being shamed for not participating in after work activities with coworkers because you don't have the spoons to socially absolutely right right like that there's a right way to be like, and first off i would i would imagine that Participating in after work activities, eating in the lunchroom, those were probably not in the required activities of the job. I bet they were not. Um, so that, all that. So um, Maggie, do you wanna like, do, do, like do, are, are, are you situated? Can I introduce you? Yeah, I'm, I'm um, situated. <laughs> what, you're situated? I situated, yeah. You're situated. I want to like give you a chance to like warm up and like arrive. Thanks. I totally kind of thought it was, I sent you an email with everything I was thinking. Yeah. And then I fell asleep. And then I was like, of course, I'm waking up late. <laughs> Turns out the need to rest was an access need. I, I know. And I was like, oh, it's fine. I can roll right out of a nap and get on this call. It's totally fine. <laughs> also, I can't, if you don't have spoons to talk, no. I I'm excited. I mean, I okay. stuff. I mean, you know what I was hoping to talk about. So if yeah. if, if I missed and like if people are talking about other things and you know there's another direction to go, I'm totally happy to do whatever. But well, I think what you wanted to talk about, I'm gonna introduce you. Um, and what you wanted to talk about, I think a lot of people are gonna want to hear about because uh, sometimes we can't find an environment that meets our access needs and we have to create our own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I am so excited to introduce Maggie Carr, uh, who is owner of Three Mountain Cafe in Waitsfield, Vermont. Um, so Maggie is a neurodivergent small business owner who is focused on celebrating neurodivergent folks in the workplace, um, who is on her own journey of discovering all the things, including her own access needs and cultivating a workplace environment. So like as an employer um, and a business owner and in like, like creating your own work experience to, 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 do, to do all the things. Yeah. So yeah. welcome. Thank you. <laughs> this is also my first brain club. So I'm hoping I have it on my um, calendar every week. So I'm hoping to make it and not be asleep for it every time. <laughs> but, and if you're asleep, it's okay because we record. Yes, exactly. So it can follow up, um, <laughs> which, is, which is beautiful. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like you get yeah, so it. Can you, can you tell us about your business? Yeah, so um, I own a cafe that um, it's actually a legacy business. It's a coffee shop in our in our little ski resort town, um, and it's been a coffee shop forever. And I, when I moved to the town, I got a job here and knew that the the place was for sale. Um, 
and at first was like no 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 like I'm getting this job because I just need I'm coming out of being in student life in higher education and I just need like a norm a normal job like don't give me anything that's gonna you know give me too many creative juices like I just want I want like to go on autopilot and have a normal job and um so the longer I kind of thought about it though like knowing that the business was for sale like it just sort of like inevitably that's just who I am and I was like I could do this and um I could make this this big beautiful thing and it could you know there's so many I have so many ideas um and so after a year of working there and like eight months into the pandemic, I was like, no better time to buy a business. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, so some miracles kind of all came together that made it possible for us to, to uh, like finance for the cafe, which was at the time, honestly, I didn't realize how heavily I was leaning on sort, sort of my husband's executive functioning to help sort of like push that application through for um, financing and all that stuff. But I was sort of, I've always been sort of the face of all the ideas for the cafe and um, and yeah, so the cafe was already because of our local, um, it's called Upper Valley Services. I don't know if anyone else on the call is familiar with like Washington County Upper Valley Services, but um, um, one employee whose name is Alicia um, had an existing relationship working there and on, another employee, Nikki, um, who, had been working there before too they already kind of had this mini sort of neurodivergent population um working at the cafe and me in the background too not really knowing that I was neurodivergent as well um and I think it was honestly them like being around other neurodivergent people so like they sort of inspired and made, well, made me feel comfortable first, you know what I mean? And like welcome in that space and wanting to just like help them feel just as welcome and, you know, um, sort of like allow them to really shine and grow in the space as much as I could, which I was just their peer at that time. But um, so interestingly, um, I was like, we like when I bought the place, I was like, we really need to make this a space for everybody. Like, these staff members have been here even before I was and like they are the face of the business even more than I am and the community knows them um so let's sort of make this a place that's centered around neurodiversity um and the more that we figured out how to do that which involved you know a lot of like how do we do things now um and how should we maybe start doing it so that people like Alicia can run the register um and Nikki can who doesn't um, typically feel comfortable like engaging customers directly and sort of stays on the food unit. Like how can we get Nikki to feel confident and that he has access to like whatever he needs to successfully engage a customer from like beginning to the end. Um, and it's all sort of like came together kind of naturally. Um, and I think in part is because I understood um, like that, there are multiple ways to do things and that everyone can can kind of, you know, have their own ways of participating in what it is we do today. Um, if we choose like, let that happen and like make space for maybe that looking a little different than normal. Um, and so I kind of pushed that and um, we had some days that were like really confusing, I think, for customers, <laughs> maybe really confusing for some of our staff who who were like, like taking the risks of trying a new way of doing things. Um, but eventually, like everyone sort of started seeing that that was a direction we were moving in and the community was just very supportive of us, like, um, you know, uh, putting someone at the register who you, who you might not typically engage with on a day to day basis, um, who like who can't speak, um, you know, like coherently all the time. And like, how do you, how do you engage cust like a, like someone at a register who has very specific communication needs. And so the community was sort of forced along with us to, to like figure it out. You know what I mean? Like this is possible, um, which made me feel good. Like I was not asking them for something unreasonable, you know, like, you, like we can all do this. <laughs> um, so it was a bit of a just sort of, um, 
you know, it was all coming together as we were also pushing the business down, down the hill, you know, just staying open every day. Um, and the other thing too, is like neurodivergent, um, workforce and like how underutilized, um, and how many people are under like unemployed and everyone's struggling to have, keep their doors open. And it's like, we had people who like Alicia, Nikki, Chris, um, all connected to Upper Valley Services and, um, like we had such a tight community throughout the pandemic and um, no issues with, um, I shouldn't say no issues, but <laughs> like we had people who wanted to come to work and cause it was our little, it was our space in our community and um, yeah. And so I, you know, I'll start there. Um, but I guess part of it is like, what I realized over time is that I, as a neurodivergent person, was creating a space really for me um, where like my needs could be met and then realized like, holy cow, I've got all these other people around me whose needs can also be met and celebrated. And like, we can kind of bring our community along for the ride. Um, and so that's where we're at. But on the day-to-day, -day, we're running a coffee shop, <laughs> um, which my husband is like, um, he's really the day-to-day -day driver of like, what that like running that system which is because that's just like as someone who's currently working with an executive functioning coach like not my wheelhouse like it's sort of things that I'm learning like okay if I need to executive function in this way like how do I access that I'm still in a place in life where I'm figuring that out and um but the um yeah more of the social drive and the um the community definitely aspect is all sort of, that's like my, what I'm sort of propelling all the time. Yeah. That is an incredible story. Um, so, so um, you know, I, th I think what I'm hearing, um, so two weeks ago, we had a, a conversation with uh, with Hannah Bloom, who's an occupational therapist on our board of directors um, about how you have to be regulated mm. in order to create a safe environment and that was like what do you mean what do you what do you what do you mean because it was about it was about neurodiversity affirming culture at home it's like yeah. Well, yeah you have to feel safe in your body in your environment before you can create safe space because energy is part of this yeah. If I am dysregulated, I put out energy involuntarily into the in, into the ether. And part of neuroinclusion is being aware of the fact that there are many people who are hypersensitive to energy, to input, to vibe. And so that ends up being a conflicting access need thing. But if like somebody is frenetic and chaotic it's not it's 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 often because they're dysregulated yeah so you're yeah. saying you had to create an environment where your own access needs could be met and I would imagine that the regulation status of your employees is probably impacting you like yeah. in a helpful way if your employees are regulated much like when my child is regulated I'm more regulated but when I'm dysregulated my child is more likely to be dysregulated also like it's co-regulation is everywhere yeah yeah um Maggie yeah hi um my name's Matt Mulligan I'm uh, a board member um here at uh, All Brains Belong. And um, you said your business is in Waitsfield? Yes. Yeah, which is lovely. Um, one of my favorite <laughs> places to go. Um, and I'm wondering, is the, the, the model that you're developing uh, and the connection you have with Upper Valley Services, is, is the, the model of your business, is it well known within the community? Yeah, that's the thing that... Um... I'm really like in the next year trying to figure out like, because a lot of it was organically kind of happening because of like who we chose to employ, you know, we, we used our skills and knowledge of, you know, each other to like figure it out. And I think the next part is, is like, 
how do we articulate what we're doing so other people can benefit and understand what we're doing? Um, and I was part of like, I found All Brains belong, you know, for myself, but also um, because we're trying to like, to have more of a face where we're like, hey, we're actually doing something here. This isn't just like um, an accident, uh, <laughs> like a happy accident. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and there are other businesses that I follow too that are, um, that's my favorite thing to do is just like follow along with who's doing what and how they're doing it and collecting all the information. But um, uh, yeah, so that's sort of where we're at. And I think like being keyed into this community, especially is going to help me like figure out how do I say this, like what mm -hmm. we're doing? How do I talk mm -hmm. about this community of people? And um, cause there's so much I have to learn and um, but I know universal design, for instance, I think is a really easy place for us to start um, talking about it. And like, cause there's already existing, you know, un, like knowledge out there about it, ways to reference it, um, like just enough to talk about with that, that I think like that might be the, the first place to start with at least like what we talk about on Instagram and like maybe we make some posters in the cafe that talk about stuff like this, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And uh, my follow-up would be, um, um, it seems to be that, that neuroinclusion in, in traditional systems is a real hard um, push. Um, it's hard to make happen within um, established systems. Um, yeah. But the bottom line, you know, businesses, nonprofits, everybody in the world, businesses need to generate income. Yes, and, yes. <laughs> um, you know, is there a case to be made that a neuro-inclusive work environment enhances a business's ability to make more money? Yeah, for sure. And um, we like, we're actually about to go through uh, refinancing because of the startup financing we got in the pandemic was not like a long-term thing. So we're ready to like refinance and artic start to articulate all of this as well, like um, to, to lenders, you know, like yeah. this, sustainable model um but it's funny just because like from personal like when you say that when you say like is this like is there a case to be made I think that there's this like deep insecurity as a neurodivergent person that like I'm going to screw this up mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's particularly financially and mm -hmm. like, over the last year um like so my husband and I are also newlyweds like bless his soul mm -hmm. because um like um I don't know. I'm just like the dreamer. I'm the impulsive one, you know, let's buy a business. Everything's going to be beautiful and great. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, we're just like learning a lot about ourselves still. Um, and so there was like a pretty significant financial like downfall over last year that we've been crawling out of. Um, and so like for any person who is like neurodivergent or hoping to work with neurodivergent people, like knowing who you're, who your team is um and like what you're good at and what you know you have a hard time like grasping because like mel and i were talking about like literacy with quickbooks like and in my head after i watched all the commercials as a kid about quickbooks like and how accessible it is i was like oh perfect it's gonna give me all these little like these little um you know images that are easy to interpret and yeah i was just thoroughly disappointed and like um uh, like trying so hard to figure out how can I, how can I get this information in the way that I need it? And it took me, a, like, it took me too long to figure that out before I needed, like, we were in crisis mode financially, and I needed to step in for some critical help. Um, and so if I had known sort of earlier, like, that I, that I wasn't neurotypical, and that that was something that, like, like dyscalculia is something that I'm like trying to understand like do I have that and um but I mean I could go on about that and just so like in particular I wanted to talk about how I'm neurodivergent and needed to create a space for my own employment but also wanted to share that with other neurodivergent people and like one of my major hurdles was understanding the finances of that business knowing that that's not really my strength um and yeah so and it would be great, like Vermont in particular has so many resources for small business owners too. Um, if they had more specific um, 
uh, support like for people who don't have typical brains. You know what I mean? Like I, I accessed all of the information, but still had some major, major, major troubles. <laughs> yes, because um, the, uh, the, 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 the traditional trains, and there are like a, a, so many fantastic resources to support yeah. entrepreneurs. Yeah. And there yeah. is a, um, an underlying assumption of a brain that functions in a particular way. And I think that, um, you know, I think your story is making the case for a culture of interdependence where, um, you know, here, you know, I, 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 I can say as someone who has a, has dyscalculia, I have a math related learning disability. Um, I never thought I could run a business, mm -hmm. never, ever. Um, and I like, I didn't know I was neurodivergent. I just knew that like numbers made me anxious and I don't like things that make me feel anxious and incompetent without kind of recognizing that, you know, my brain needs to turn numbers into words and like that I could, and then it's like, okay, it's not like, you know, like when you think about the way that some people refer to adulting and adulting in that ableist way is referring to having exemplary executive functioning skills or like, you know, advanced math skills or like whatever. Um, but I think that part of my co-regulation experience with my patients, with my staff, is that I try to just authentically and transparently being like, I have no idea what this means. Can yes. we look at it together? Oh, you don't know what it is either? <sighs> Let's call in a someone. And like okay. knowing your team, not even like within your your team, but like your, um, like the different onion peel layers of the resources in your community that you're like your, your, your village, it's like your team and your village. Um, because I think that part of breaking down silos is recognizing that like, you know, there's, there's people who know how to do most things. You just, it's, it's, and, and you don't have to like, it, it's about relationships you form relationships and you're authentic in those relationships mm. and people help you and you help people and it's okay. Yeah. But it's like, you have to reimagine what entrepreneurship is. Um, I'm just seeing in the chat, um, Jose talking about the co-regulation among employees and with the customers. Yeah, yeah, I and, 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 and I, I think that you know, like if, if we can think about not even in our own employment experiences, whether employer or employee, but like just when you, when you go into a cafe, when you go into a store, when you go to a healthcare practice, you can tell when the people are stressed out, right? So, I mean, I, 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 yeah. Oh, hi, Athena, go for it. Um, I wanted to mention this because it was the perfect timing uh, Maggie, I own a cafe in Stowe and Yay. had it for 12 years um, from New York City. Advertising was my background. Um, um, we have a son who's nine who has autism. Mm -hmm. uh, so in 2013, when we had had him, um, as we realized a couple of years later that he had autism, that became my whole world. And um, it's funny because as we were discussing this, I'm thinking about um, neurodivergent minds and I'm thinking about people I've come across who've worked for me in this business throughout all these years. Like I'm thinking like, yeah, well, they had, but yeah, they have, they didn't have autism, but definitely like there was so, there's so much variety. Um, and I'm thinking about access and how would I actually do that in a way that would be productive. Um, and so what I wanted to, something really interesting happened to us about five or probably seven years ago now. Um, we started to, I'm trying to remember how it happened, um, but autism and the discussions about it, if anyone knows me, it's, I'm talking about it all the time. Um, we are in a welcome, open, 
um, employer for anybody on the spectrum. We encourage it. We have had dishwashers and we've had people who've worked up front, like in all roles here and not just, it just so happens that they've had autism. Um, um, one gentleman in particular, uh, his way of feeling comfortable while working was to uh, tell jokes. And I, we're really a busy, busy place. And <laughs> so Eric, when he'd be working on dishes, when it's, and it, he is poor, poor Eric, like it would just become very overwhelming. So all of a sudden the jokes would come out and then they would get really dirty, these jokes and um, not work appropriate. And, you know, we were caught off guard and I wasn't sure how to I wanted to make sure that the rest of the staff also felt very comfortable. Um, so we had to have a lot of conversation about, you know, we had to keep it appropriate, but we also had to have conversation about what do you, I, we weren't using words like access, like a lot of that vernacular was not something that we were using, but we are now. Um, another gentleman who's nonverbal, who has a one-on-one -on -one with him, he, when he gets excited and happy, which he is because he's here and he's the happiest when he's here. He becomes a lot of vocal stimming and a lot, very loud. And um, if she has customers, we're an open kitchen, so you can see in the back and hear everything. Um, customers would have things to say about that. And they might have questions. Um, sometimes they're not questions and they were unpleasant, interactions that we've had to have um, in my world and in my mind um, people are oh everyone in the world must be open and knowledgeable and they're really not um, so there were several times where we had thought how do we make this normal uh, i don't care how loud he wants to be i want him to feel comfortable working here i want i i'm it's uh, my son is going to be um a very loud person one day in his job uh, he'll probably own the restaurant. We'll do it forever if that's what we need to do. Um, but it's, um, it's, it is, I'm still at that point where we're not exactly sure. Uh, forgive me for how this might come across because I don't know the right way to say it. Um, I've never seen people who, who have worked for me, who've had autism. I've never seen others be so dedicated to their job and who really enjoy what they're doing, which makes me so happy. And I want to encourage more applicants who are neurodivergent to come and to work and feel comfortable. Um, even people who are outside of the spectrum, a lot of anxiety we deal with in this business. We deal with a lot, a lot of differing personalities, a lot of people in transition, a lot of, this is a lot. And, you know, when you've got 50 people, 70 people walking in the door, here for the leaves, demanding the food, um, they're my priority, my, the people who work for me, they, having them feel calm, closing my online store if I need to, um, having people wait outside until they feel our, our staff can work at a pace that they feel comfortable with is what I care about. I will close early. I will close other days if it means that my staff needs to get the ability to regulate because I want them to come back and I want them to feel safe and have a place to work. So I'm really excited um, just to hear more about everyone's experiences um, because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a real eye opener for me. So uh, thank you for welcoming me, welcoming me to the group. I'm so excited to be here and to come to all the meetings. I just wanted to jump in and, and say that I did, uh, I did relate very much so to, um, uh, to, to not really quite sure about how to have the conversation with the community or if I needed to, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you so much, Athena, for sharing that. And I would say that I, 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 um, when, when, when I, when I, when I do trainings to the general community who are not like necessarily here to like for, with a particular interest or lens, they're just, anyway, um, I talk about how, it's, it's an outdated concept that there is a normal brain and everyone else. Neurodiversity 
is like biodiversity. It's the infinite number of ways in which people learn, think, and communicate. And so we are all on this continuum and we all have unique strengths and, you, and challenges. We're, we all have that. And so it's, so it's not like an us versus them kind of thing. And so with that in mind, if, if I think about how there's no one right way to have a brain, there's no one right way to be a human, um, that means that if someone is shaming someone for being a human, um, I'm gonna call them out on that microaggression because when I think about neurocultural competence, um, what we permit, we promote. And yeah, I don't tolerate that because it's like any other, um, you know, cultural microaggression. So, um, uh, so, so I know, I know we haven't met before, but I'm also autistic. And um, I think that um, many people don't recognize that there is a culture, neurodivergent culture. And um, uh, m m uh, when, um, when anyone interfaces with, whether that be a customer or, you know, whatever, people in the world, like, <laughs> if you have that paradigm of there's no right way to be a person, um, yeah. like everything else just is taking care of itself, right? Like, did you know there's no one right way to be a person? <laughs> so uh, I, 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 I say that just like that at least a couple times every week. You should have a t-shirt. I love that. There's no wrong way okay. to be a person. I think that's a great. We should totally, we should have ABD t-shirts. And yes. you guys can sell them in your cafes. We sell seven different product lines from neurodivergent um, individuals who live in the area. And I love it. I don't think I sell much of anything. If you, <laughs> uh, we, we partner with a lot of people. Um, Maggie, you should connect with the people over at Bellcate for their dog snacks. They we sell out of them like crazy and uh, they're made by all the folks up there. It's awesome. Yeah, I will sell those shirts. What's what's the name of your cafe? It's called the Green Goddess Cafe. Oh my gosh, I go there all the time. It looks really familiar. Community connection. It's I love like, it. I need a, a cafe to go. Like I'm always going to cafes in the area because I need somewhere to go now that I made yeah, my yeah, five. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh gosh, where do I go now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's I awesome. know the feeling. Oh, so, so good to know. So Maggie, I have a question for you because we have we have a we have about five minutes left. Um, when we think about how many neurodivergent folks think that they can't ever run a business, I wonder what advice you might have for someone who's like been in been in like 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 unable to find an employment space and culture that really works for their brain mm -hmm. um, I, you know, like, like 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 for example like um the, the, one of one of the reasons i quit my job to try to change the world was that my autonomy was violated and turns out autonomy is an access need mm -hmm. um, so for people who are in that sphere how how can people begin the unlearning process of the i can't do it yeah well, I mean, I know I like, absolutely. There was a time, um, I think it actually started when I was having like body image issues. And I was like, I need to totally clear out my Instagram and fill it with what I want to see and what I need to see and what I want in my life. And so like that really started it when I was in like college, but now every time like I identify with a need that I have, I go and I scour, it's not even, it doesn't even take that long because there are communities out there and people influencers if you will um who like who are out there like saying the same thing over and over and over again with all this media attention to it like visuals like talks links to other resources um that like so that has been really important for me to find like I always um uh know like there's somebody else out there I go hmm like 
I'm neurodivergent and I'm a business owner. There's got to be someone out there with a hashtag that's like neurodivergent business owner. And so like I, I use Instagram as a tool in that way to like the world that I want to see. Like I literally put it in my pocket because I like of who I choose to follow on on social media which I know social media is like dicey and like um, there's a lot of things to not like about social media, but <laughs> um, it's a complicated world out there, but you do kind of have this power to fill your pocket with the world that you want to see. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, and so I think that has been pretty critical for me, just like seeing other people representation is like super important. And I know we know that from all the other kind of social movements um, out there, like that's really representation is important and listen like seeing people talk about talk about it goes like a really really long way um and so and people just being honest and um like you said um um I forget exactly how, what um what you said but um like not pretending that we have it all together all the time like just showing when you screw up and um like talking honestly and transparently about how it's really going um is like like groundbreaking for people they're like whoa I can do this like I can really talk about how it's going and I don't have to be perfect all the time it's good for everyone to see that and um no matter who you are and I think that I learned that lesson like when I was a kid so I think I got that like superpower <laughs> early <laughs> um but I get it that like it, not everybody realizes that and there's this sort of learning curve to figuring out like oh I can be myself and I can screw up and it will be okay like <laughs> um yeah so and I see myself more as like a person who's comfortable with risk um than maybe the average person but like yeah so if you want to do some risky business and you need some help um like with encouragement just I'll have a conversation with you. <laughs> Maggie, Maggie, you're helping to start a revolution. Yeah, <laughs> let's take some risks and, and challenge the norm, you know. I mean, challenging the norm is always risky, but um, there's always a community around every corner that, that gets you, you know, and that's, that's really, I don't know, that's what keeps everyone going, I think. <laughs> oh, that is so beautiful. You know, I think when we think about... Um, you know, the, 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 the broader ADB village, you know, I just, I, I, I think about like the universe brings the people mm -hmm. like exactly where the people need to be for one another. Yeah. And like at the, at the, at the, at the time, the time that they, that they need it. And I think, uh, you know, building, building the world that we we, we wish to see because the current one like is not working for like most brains right so like you can reimagine systems and you have to leave the broken ones and 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 create your own world like a lot of a lot of the time and whether that's like you know within the culture of your family um, or of, 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 of the, your educational approaches within your family, maybe it is thinking about what are you really passionate about? If meaning and purpose is an access need, if you're not doing that in your current employment, like if, even if the, the, the lights are okay, like you're not going to feel self-actualized. You're not going to be living your best life. And the broader culture of interdependence is such that you 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 don't it doesn't have to be super risky. Um, so being as Jose as Jose, we just like dope is synced. We just like use the same word at the same time. Um, so so uh, comfortable with risk and being open to uncertainty um, uh, is 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 a strength in this changing world. Absolutely. Go ahead, Maggie. Go for it. Tell us about executive right. function coaching. I saw earlier in the chat, people were like, how do you find someone like this? And uh, interestingly enough, I looked for hashtag Instagram, hashtag executive functioning coach and found all of these people who are making beautiful media, um, talking about executive functioning and all these really like progressive ways. And um, most of these people do the work um, remotely because they just need to sit and sort of chat with you once a week. Um, and, and it's more about finding someone who at least for me, I was scoured some Instagram pages and like could tell, 
kind of who I aligned with based on the content that they were posting. Um, but that has been, again, just like normalizing that executive functioning is really like everybody has it um, and people need different ways of accessing it and like getting it going inside of them. And that that's just like a normal, it's normal. <laughs> and everybody, like everybody accesses executive functioning at different capacities at different times, depending on different circumstances and like um, learning as much as you can about yourself um, and your own needs to, ex to access executive functioning is like, I don't know. It, so I've only been, I've been doing that for like maybe two months. And it's been, I had that same question where I was like, how do, like, there must be a person out there who does exactly that. Like, I learned about executive functioning and then I was like, I'm going to use my hashtag uh, source here and see what comes up. Um, so, yeah, I hope that helps for some people. Maggie? Uh, um, I was wondering, did I see, does your website offer an app? Um, at the cafe? You have online ordering. Oh, yes. Online ordering. That's online one, order. Yeah. So one thing that we need to work on is just like multiple ways to engage with us. But like, and I know online ordering is super helpful for some people to not have to go in and do all the things. <laughs> yeah. No, I plan to come. I plan to come visit. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. I look forward to it. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, what uh, Jose in the chat says, new language creation is necessary for the paradigm shift. Yeah, so paradigm, like the lens through which you see the world and language, I think are inextricably linked. Um, so, you know, if um, it, 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 language to describe your own identity, language to describe, you know, like I just, I think there's so many terms. Oh yeah, oh, dope is, oh, you're, oh, you're yeah, dope is sparkle. Um, uh, so, so for, for anyone who knows the uh, uh, Steven Universe, the cartoon, um, when, when the characters, I think, look like they're getting dopamine, um, they have stars in their eyes, and that's how the creator draws them. So, so my five-year-old and I, we call it Dopa Sparkle. Um, so anyway, <laughs> um, um, I forget what I was going to say, but it's about time to, 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 to wrap up anyway. Oh, no, I did remember. Now I remembered. Um, uh, and then, and then, and then, and then, Mia, I'm going to call on you in a second. Um, uh, so, so there are so many people for whom autonomy is an access need, and so uh, stay tuned in 2023. We are working on building a neurodivergent entrepreneur support program um, because I think that um, the executive functioning load of even building your village to start a business is just so, so steep, right? So anyway, we're gonna do it. Mia. Yeah, I've uh, only joined late because because uh, I, I fell asleep earlier and meant to join, but what was <laughs> said about new language creation I think that it can be hard even for us to, to, to use the language available just because I think, I know for me, when I was shut down, I just found it so hard to express myself just because of always being told I was wrong. And so, um, so yeah, it's like we need, to, we need to also be able to, to find ways to well, to to enable people to to access the language already existing as well. Um, right, and I think this also comes back to co-regulation. Hmm. So I think that um, you know many of us, myself included, lose access to spoken communication when dysregulated, and um, normalizing there being, you know, uh, not not only normalizing non-spoken ways of communication, um, but also looking at um, if if our access needs are not being met, um, we're not going to have full access to our cortex. And spoken yeah. communication is a is a high level um, it's a high level cortical skill. So with yeah, and this. Uh, yeah. 
going to say, and there's so much stigma, stigmatization towards anyone who's uh, dysregulated, like it's uh, like they look and they'll think, oh, there's something wrong with that person without looking at the context, like why are they dysregulated or what's That's happening? Right. To That's right. Yeah. And so... Um... Uh, that's it's when 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 I do trainings, that's one of the first things I talk about is so you know when you see someone dysregulated, you should wonder why. Um, and it's like I don't know if anybody's read um, uh, Uniquely Human by Barry Prezant, one of my favorite books ever. Um, you know that 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 that's 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 where I first learned that. Um, and you know it 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 makes it when you think about workplace interactions, um, even if somebody is not overtly flipping their lid, throwing things and screaming, um, uh, l learning to recognize this regulation in other people and in yourself, like given how, you know, the wide way, ways in which this regulation can present. Um, but also when you think about workplace conflict, um, it's, it's almost always related to conflicting access needs or failure to understand the access needs of someone else. And so uh, that's, that's why we keep having these conversations because you know uh, awareness and connection, it brings us one step closer to the world we wish to see. So thank you, thank you all so much for being here. And we will look forward to seeing you next week where we'll be talking about neuroinclusive recreation. Very cool.